This episode of The Last Drinks Podcast is sponsored by Zekka Skin. Zekka Skin specializes in high-quality men's skincare products that not only benefit the health of your skin, but also support men's mental health. Use discount code LASTDRINKS25 at checkout to get 25% off all Zekka Skin products. I'll get stuck into it. So this is another episode of The Last Drinks Podcast. I'm thrilled to be here, also known as Will Hitchens. <laughs> And my guest today is Chris Laidlaw. Hello, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, just like the dry sense of humor since following you is just cracking me up. <laughs> just, like, you know, like, I'll just take a moment, have a laugh, sit there and watch Will on fucking Instagram. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fucking around on social media, adding absolute nonsense to yeah. the internet. Yeah. Oh, mate, honestly, anything on the net that makes you laugh and has that... F- attachment to feel good is always a positive mm, yeah so yeah we met in the gym at s30 uh briefly and then you i guess you know, i guess in our chats you mentioned that you've had a bit of a, a journey to uh quitting drugs and alcohol yourself mm, mm. um so how long have you been dry i guess um 16th of december last year mm-hmm. 2022 was like kind of it wasn't like a cut and shut it was just I was at my brother's birthday party, um, you know, had a drink, you know, all the other shit that's combined with it, and I just kind of got home. And I'm like, just done, mm-hmm. like just you know, bed's made. Fuck it, I'm done. Yeah. And since then, I've tried not to attach the whole like, you know, people are like I'm now one thousand three hundred forty five days. Yeah. It's like, well, you're not because mm. you're still counting the days, and you're mm. still kind of at, like having those you know moments where each and every day you're stepping away from it it's just mm. 16th of december and I'll, that'll be a re- it's more of a milestone that i attach to than an actual accolade where i'm like this is how many days i'm free because i couldn't tell you the days between then and now yeah mm. yeah because i mean for me like i on a whim i guess sometime last year i was curious how many days it'd been since my last drink and and then i worked out that like oh this date was a thousand days so i know that i'm over a thousand now um I mean, I was even looking before, so I was like, when's 2000? And it's like, not till like March 2024. So it's just, it's kind of this curiosity, but yeah, like I don't count how the days anymore. How does it feel for you seeing like that, you know, that? Because it's, I mean, that's a, it's a big number, a thousand. So if you mm. see that, how did that make you feel? Well, it's the longest that I've been sober, I guess, before I guess I started drinking. Mm. So um, yeah, I guess to think that there was a time where I'd struggle to get a day or even a week yeah. um, without having putting something in my system yeah it's kind of a surreal thing i guess and we're all that's that's just yeah the trajectory going forward we'll just keep it going because it's it's certainly in my experience it's it's one of the best decisions i ever made yeah like i agree you know that that what you just said then about you know couldn't i couldn't go three or four days you know like it was from thursday night thirsty thursdays hungover as fuck friday Friday was all about like just getting through that work day. Like mm. it literally felt like, I don't know what animal with broken legs, just dragging yourself mm. to that 3.30 mark and then m- like mouth literally watering, going into the bottle shop, knowing that I'm just going to get myself that fucked up. Mm. And then Sunday morning, I'm like dulled to the room, pinging off my head still, looking at my probably my Nokia 3310 at the time. <laughs> 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 like looking at like full paradigm going like, is it Sunday three four sunrise and knowing that like the next day is work yeah and to try and cram like three days sleep into a Sunday afternoon and mm. KFC and anything else that was yeah. calorie dense to think that that was going to work yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a bit it, yeah it's a wild ride to, yeah that we we just kept you, you can be consistent with it and you do it every weekend mm. and you don't ever step back to look is this really the best way to use my time it's just like now nah, we're living in the moment this is yeah. what you do <laughs> so that whole like remember that acronym yolo yeah like that must have got thrown around mm. literally faster than a bag yeah you know like <laughs> have one sip of beer this tastes like 300 bucks yolo <laughs> <laughs> you know next minute you're like again it's the same bullshit you mm. have that first line and someone else is in on it and then yeah. you know it's you just start giving each other the wink wherever you mm. are and you just know the wink and then all of a sudden you know, it's like the next weekend you didn't want to get a bag old mates had a beer he walks out gives you the wink mm. and you just know that that's that constant and you laugh it off mm. thinking it's fucking funny yeah and then you're in the next minute you're literally doing lines off the grubbiest fucking toilets like, <laughs> off the toilet lid so near the flush and you're like 
Yeah. This is fucking living. Like, <laughs> this has to be living. <laughs> this is living, Barry. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. So I guess we can we'll go into I guess the origins of how did you did you was it did you start with alcohol or did you start? Yeah. With, so my parents uh, back in New Zealand owned a I would say a quite a successful bar mm-hmm. um, that have massive parties. The place they rock the joint. You know, mm. like it's my parents they were seventy or sixties kids. You know, they mm-hmm. knew how to party. So. The bar would always kick off and dad would always pick a select few humans to come back to our parents our parents place had like it was in new zealand so we had like a 35 degree pool mm. like with the hot water coming out of the ground so they'd have these parties to like two in the morning everyone would be pissed as so we were like my brothers and i were quite surrounded by it you could say you know seeing my dad drink like half a bottle of wild turkey with coke a night wasn't mm. but he wasn't like he he enjoyed a drink yeah and he like never i must say that if he ever listens to this like i never disrespect him for doing that mm. like the man liked to drink fucking. yeah but for us there was no understanding of like how much is enough mm. so when we used to drink you know we'd sneak away at times and it was never about it was just finish it all because what were we going to do with it mm. and you know like you, you literally would go to someone's house you'd be drunk someone would have a bill you'd have a bong you'd green out everyone would laugh at you mm. and the next day you'd be laughed at at school and it's funny <laughs> yeah. you know like just like the level for me was just never really understanding where the line in the sand was with what how much to consume mm. or if anything ever came up like i didn't actually start taking um drugs until i was about late 17 18 years old mm. so for me it was just about how fast could i drink to get it in to be drunk yeah and it was anything like, mm. and i like used to pride myself and um big Dar said it best to him when i spoke to him at world gym one day i used to fucking get off on being able to drink faster than anyone mm. like literally like yeah. a liter of goon like that yeah and it was funny yeah but yeah then, Literally by like 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, I'm rolling around on the grass, just literally licking the fucking grass because yeah. it's keeping me cool and I don't want to spew myself anymore. Mm. Like it's, it just, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just absolutely, like, yeah. It was just the norm though, mm. you know, like just the damage that, that comes from it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because there really isn't, you know, when we are in our teenage years and we discover alcohol, there's no... There's no, there's no inkling of like well let, let's drink this responsibly it's mm. always just like oh we want to get to the feeling of feeling drunk straight away so mm. it's just consuming as much as possible but when you when you look at you know yourself and, and the sense of it what is responsible drinking mm. and where is the line and the game in the sand with the responsible like yeah. is, is it do you keep you know, breathalyzing yourself until you get to a p- specific point where you're at and that's your mm. responsible because like one of the things you shared, it's the only thing that we fucking do where if you rock up with a carton of mid-strength, someone gives you shit because you're not drinking full strength. If you mm. don't drink at all, you're giving shit. Mm. And when you drink too much of it, you're fucking, you're like ridiculed for being a pisshead. <laughs> you know, like, you, well, it's just so oxymoronic. Yeah. It's just like, oh, you're not drinking. We're going to poke at you for that. Mm. If you drink too much and fuck up, we're going to poke at you for that. It's just like, <laughs> we want you to somewhere in the middle. You've got to be able to balance it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, like, don't drink enough that you can't drive and drink enough so like you just where is it like but then there's just so like mid-range it's just mm. like i think that to, f- to drink to feel good is too much to drive mm. but then to drink to get fucked up it's just like <laughs> you know how much have i eaten that day and all the bullshit that yeah. goes that i think i heard it some i think i heard it somewhere it's about maybe people's perception is that if you're not drinking then you mustn't be having a good time Mm. like there's this attachment to having a good time and drinking and so if you're able to just show up without drinking and still have a good time um how would you say it just like well they've they've been conditioned whether however however through whether it's been forming this attachment with alcohol from an Mm. early age that oh this having drinking alcohol and having a good time go hand in hand Mm. and then someone comes along who doesn't drink and they're having a good old time without it it it, i guess conflicts with that that just like well this is how i see it Mm. and this guy's challenging on my worldview (laughs) 100 percent. like i was down like literally today i was down in um timbolgum and i'm walking into the shopping center i believe it was timbolgum and there was a sign that said how are you feeling and right next to it was a stubby of two is new Mm. like the correlation of how are you feeling is to be better with alcohol yeah like 
I, even as a child, if you're in a pram, you know, like you with flashcards and bullshit, like if you see that enough, it gets it's going to get ingrained in your subconscious. Mm. And if you would start associating alcohol with that good feeling, then you're pretty much fucked from the you know, point that you even start drinking. Yeah, yeah. So as you, I guess you're in your teenage years just experimenting with alcohol and you said you started to get into drugs. So how did it just progress from there when you, I guess, became... Well, technically an adult at 18 <laughs> well like a lot a lot changed for me because i turned 18 and um because i was drinking so heavily and like i'd had a girlfriend at the time long story short went to byron bay and i got um sexually assaulted by a man um so because of the only coping mechanism i knew in regards to how to deal with problems like mm-hmm. you know girl broke my heart at 17 drinking with the mother boys you know everything was going on in my life just drinking you know mm. friday's coming like literally shaking passion pop to his flat and mm. beer bonging it then like they got like sexually assaulted the only way i knew how to deal with it was just this massive suppression of like going even harder yeah and not telling anyone about it mm. so yeah i really kind of got after it and then um moved down to sydney and that kind of changed um my whole idea of how alcohol worked because then like ecstasy pills became a thing mm. and then you know having half a half a dinger at the time and then it coming on and then drinking there was this whole new level of euphoria that yeah i mean i could dance and sweat my ass off have a good time be wasted you know and just keep taking pills and because of the accessibility of it and like how cheap it was at the time then you know to go out with 10 pills mm. and get myself fucked up on whatever i get my hands on and mm. like somehow i'd wake up at home i'm like I don't want. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want. Like, yeah. yeah, sweet. Like, and then yeah. there'd be all these people the next week going, "Fuck, you were so much fun last week, mm. man!" Like, holy shit, what were you doing? I was like, I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> and, and luckily, at the time, there weren't smartphones, so mm. no one could film my bullshit. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> there was this whole level of like how far you could go. Now, I think there's a bit more. It's a bit more tame because I think people are just afraid of being seen of how far they actually go. But at the time, Mm. yeah, so, yeah, Sydney was really, really took off for me. Pills and Coke were an everyday thing. And there was a point then where if I couldn't get on to to pills, I wasn't drinking. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to. I would spend like half my night chasing, you know, five or six pills whilst driving around drinking Mm. to then step it up once I got some. Yeah. And it's just like drug addict yeah 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 <laughs> so like the drinking was warming up for the drugs yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah mm. and it you know it wasn't and because obviously i was earning quite good money it wasn't just beer like mm. it was like mixed you know 70 30 vodka yeah 70 percent vodka just to get there faster and you know the correlation between excessive amounts of drugs and alcohol is black out yeah <laughs> pretty much yeah <laughs> Would you say because i guess the scene that you're in and the accessibility of drugs um, that made it easier to get a handle of them or were you just that keen on drugs that you would do anything? I to... think it was probably a mix of both. Mm. Like just, you know, knowing that, you know, I was just going to have this, like at, obviously I didn't know about the hormones that were being dumped on my system or good good hormones and all that type of stuff. Mm. I was just chasing that constant like battle with like being so loose and so out of shape. Like, you know like seeing actual photos of myself printed kodak photos and my jaws like out here Mm. and i thought i was like man i must look fly as fuck right now and i see the photo (laughs) and i'm like how many of those did you get printed (laughs) where's the where's the fucking (laughs) don't want anyone to say that no no not at all like that gets home to my mom fuck (laughs) it's not something that's this up in the in the in the family you know no photo, not, not in the photo, pool room no. not in the pool room. but like even so it actually got um moving into like my 20s and stuff when my mum started and dad started to find out that i was doing drugs so that actually changed how much i did drugs mm-hmm. for some reason you know like i just as soon as my parents knew i wasn't as for some reason so keen to get so rattled all the time so you know and then obviously trying to like you know started my trade as a plumber and being a plumber, as soon as you can learn a few good skills as a plumber as an apprentice, you can be going out doing cash work. Mm. Sorry, taxman. <laughs> um, going out doing cash work, you know, for like seventy, eighty, ninety dollars an hour. Mm. And at twenty one years old, twenty two years old, charging that amount, there were points where I would literally charge how much it would cost me to get a bag of pills mm. and then that would be the 
bill, you know. Yeah. And then, of course, I wouldn't pay the fucking bills of the material, be loose all weekend, and I'd be chasing my tail. And that's when mm. like, this whole new world of fucking dodging bullshit just to charge to get my hands on whatever I could. Yeah. And you think that, I guess, this chasing your tail with all the drugs and all the booze was in direct correlation with not dealing with, I guess, some of the traumas that you experienced a couple of years yeah, earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Like, because mm. it, it wasn't really um, a day went by that I wouldn't think about what happened, um, whether I was sober or to the point where I would be getting fucked up. It would still be just hovering around the back of my head. And, you know, like, it just wasn't until, um, funnily enough, I actually got my security license. I think it was about uh, 28 years old. Mm. And I went out working security and I remember um, men acting how that man had acted towards me Mm. and I started to see this pattern and I really started to like um, I I think I would say I saved quite a lot of girls because of what I would see Mm. play out in front of me from him Yeah, and I started to let go I was like I started to not regret what had happened because then there was this whole like oh it It wasn't my fault. Mm. I couldn't handle it. Like I see people saw it play out in front of me and just the way that it was like, I think I've used this term before, it was um, a maze. It was like watching a scientist watch a rat run around a maze and the scientist knew where the rat was going and it was like, I would have been there at 18 where Mm. just this predator was like watching me fucking and he knew what was going to go on. So Mm. when I saw that play out in front of me, um, yeah, like there was just this forgiveness and then like, drugs weren't really like that predominant because I again I was then at the time like starting off my trade as a diesel fitter mm-hmm. and I was like a first year and you couldn't take drugs in the mines because yeah. well I didn't at the start because I was like oh drug testing in the mines like oh my god yeah. like, until I realised the loopholes <laughs> <laughs> what were the loopholes well the loopholes like first year in the mines I was like literally Mr. Good Boy I fucking was like Nah, I'm never doing drugs working mm. in the mines. Like I was working out in Moranbar, and this is probably going to rattle a few cages, but I was working in Moranbar. And then in my second year, I, I broke up with my then at the time girlfriend and I moved in with a mate. And the, when Johnny Depp went to prison with a degree in marijuana and then came out with a master's in cocaine, mm. that was me. Yeah. I moved in with this gentleman with no knowledge really, low end, not much understanding about how like drugs... I moved out and I knew like fucking <laughs> 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 I moved out and I was like I'm a fucking businessman yeah yeah like I just you know I knew price cost value cost where to go from how cheap it was but all these things and like but I lived with him for like nearly two and a half years and that's when like I was buying someone else's piss or urine whatever how you want to bleep that out to use if I got drug tested yeah and then I realized that the what the mine I was working at at the time I just bribed the guy that was doing the drug test. Mm. Like he's like, how, "How was your weekend, man?" I was like, "Winking him, a bit average, man." He's like, "Right, I take this one," and that was already a fucked one. Yeah, and then, yeah. Then, like so, there was, then I was like, "Oh, so I can take drugs and work in the mines." Yeah. And then I became a fully functioning meth head. Oh really? <laughs> so you got into. Th- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, fucking like, it was just coke was shit and cheap. It was just terrible. Mm. Pills were so hard to come by, but meth was just fucking rampant through all all mining towns, and it still is to this day. Mm. And I'm probably going to burst a few bubbles for a few mine managers out there that think it's not. It really isn't. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, you f- it's. I mean, but the thing was, is like, you know, I was like, I was working a f- uh, for uh, what they call a lifestyle roster, so it was four on, four off. Um, it was a three on two or two on three off mm. for my first two years and then in my third year um it became like a lot a bit more of a break so it was like i was working four and uh so i was four on five on four off mm. so on the fifth day i already had a bag i was i was on the way home in the car holding the steering wheel fucking getting lit to the rim yeah i spent my days like two or three days awake mm. and then fucking i'd be like oh, i gotta go to work in 18 hours bang a two milligram zanny and just fucking forget and like, <laughs> just like my housemate at week coming and kicking the door and going mate come on we've got to go to work yeah. no meal prep done no nothing done still mm. trying to dra- train in the gym the five days or four days I was at work Yeah, I was just on the cycle and I just remember looking at myself after like it was like a year and a half and I was still quite solid but I was looking at myself and it was just I was just looking at like just a shadow mm. just like what the fuck 
are you fucking doing? Yeah. Like, how are you... Were you are on six figures as a fourth year apprentice, respectively, and you're doing this to yourself. Mm. Like, do you want a future? Yeah. So then, like, yeah, just gave it up. Um, met another girl um, who, like, was amazing, really, really supportive. She mm. kind of knew a little bit. I didn't let her know too much because I think there was that like, afraid to be seen. Kind of got off it. And then one horrendous afternoon, that same guy who I live with came round and got high with all of us and she loved it mm. so then it was like she was like oh well we won't do it that much mm. but then every Friday comes yeah and it was just every Friday and then all of a sudden it was like oh we'll just we'll get a bit more and we'll keep some yeah yeah and just that carryover effect of mm. like you know getting that bit more and bit more each time and it was just like I'm now I'm back in the cycle again mm. you know like fucking doing high as fuck putting in a fucking light bar on the front of her car at four in the morning listening to heavy techno thinking that's a smart thing to do while I'm high on fucking Xanax oh <laughs> dear <laughs> <laughs> oh the things we do yeah yeah, yeah like literally pyrodying trying to like screw like use a drill like using a drill mm. putting a fucking little like you know it's just I look back at that now and that's a story you know like trying to run wiring and stuff like mm. looking at Google like you know YouTube looking at shit yeah so this is on Xanax or is this on meth as this well? This is on meth and Xanax. Meth and Xanax. So, so I was kind of like yeah. trying to find a balance. Mm. And then one day it started to rain in my closet and I thought I had enough. It started <laughs> to rain in your closet. Yeah. <laughs> I was legit like, I was like, I was like, here's some dripping. And I was like, well, I'm a plumber. I should know. Yeah. And I opened up the closet and it was dripping. And I was like, what the fuck? I was like, hey, babe. She goes, she goes, what's up? I'm like, it's raining in the closet. She goes, she just looked at me and she was like, um, <laughs> um, like, show me what you've had. And I was like, gave her the, the, the at the time, the empty fucking Zanny jar mm. and the empty bag. And she's like, you've done all of that? Mm. And I was like, yeah. She's like, I don't know who to call. Like, <laughs> <laughs> who do you call? Like, yeah. do, you, do you call, like, do I flush your stomach? Like, yeah. do I put you to bed? Like, are you going to die? Like, mm. I mean, at the time, she just put me in the shower, gave me a thing and, like, just literally sat with me on the couch. And I was mm. a fucking just so up and down. Like, I was mm. sweating and I was cold and there was just... My body was just in this world of pain. Yeah. Uh, and then just the way it played out, I was just like, again, I jumped on the scales and I, when I had moved out and in that year or so, I'd smashed in the gym, been going really well, got on my routine because I... I'm still to this day and always have been in love with fitness and personal training. Mm -hmm. Like it's just something that I have always been around. And so when I got on the scales after doing a lap, I was like 10 kilos lighter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fuck. And it was like in a split second, I looked at myself in the mirror and I just saw that same transparent guy. I was mm -hmm. like, ah, fucking back here, are we? Yeah. Like, you know, mm -hmm. and then just this whole ball of guilt, like, you know, Christopher, you've, You've always been a failure. You've always been a fuck up. Like you say you're in the mines with a great career, but all you're doing is doing the same shit you've always done. And mm. I was like, literally had two full trades, was doing really well from a like monetary and like a life scheme. But behind the scenes, there was this double edged sword. Like no one out in the front line knew at all what mm. I was like. Yeah. So, you know, out in the general public, it was like, you know, this fit gym junkie guy, mm. but realistically, I probably just fucking got myself that high. Yeah. I was just like fucking floating into the gym, mm. hand slept for a day, thinking I was doing a good session. The next day, like, geez, you weren't here for long. And I was like, fuck, I felt like I was here for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those uh, scenarios of don't judge a book by its cover, I guess. So yeah, very much so. Yeah. yeah. So was it hard? Because I guess, so if you had that moment and then, so was it hard to, to stop doing meth? Well, it, for me, it was it was pretty easy mm -hmm. because my mindset, and it's only probably been in like in the last three years that I've figured out is fucking unstoppable. Mm. You know, like I once I am not doing something, I'm not fucking doing yeah. it. You know, like I had this real um, like ambition to, I'm fucking done. Mm. So yeah, I gave it up. And I think that was, yeah, that was probably the last time I ever touched it. And I couldn't give you a date, but I know that it's been over five five years mm. since I've been on anything like any meth or any like anything as, as fucked up as that. Because yeah. I actually read 
one thing that really crossed the line for me was I started to research it and it's the only drug that I've seen that has this potential to change your whole brain mm. and the way that your brain is every time you smoke it. Mm. So it literally changed your whole fucking brain. And I'm just like, i got work to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. i gotta, I got to fucking do something. Like, mm. you know, so yeah, stepped off it. Um, again, really simple. But the thing was is that it, for me, stepping away from as the glass Harley or meth or whatever was easy. But the thing was is just other things crept in again. Yeah. You know, like... I was still having a, a beer. I'd work a really hot day, you know, and I was like, go home. And I knew that I had this itch, but I was like, fuck, dude, like, what do you want to be? Do you want to be 110 and like six foot four and that powerful motherfucker? Or do you want to be that strung out looking guy with these big, deep, dark patches under your eyes? Like, you can't hide that. Mm. You know, like, I just, what do I want to be? And this is before any work had come into play. Mm. I, before any understanding about reaching out to men, um, and then I like slowly started to step away from it. And then I um, started applying for jobs underground as an underground coal miner. Um, and that's when my life kind of changed in the regards to like, I got the job underground. And one of the first conversations I had underground was this like 60 year old guy who didn't have anyone to talk to. He had no kids, no wife, no nothing. And he just like, I spent literally 10 hours with this guy because an underground you wear uh, at the yellow hat mm. and they're a white hat yellow means you like obviously can't leave your um, buddy because you're fucking inexperienced and for like I was trapped with this guy respectively for like eight hours and I was like fuck there's no one in this kind of community that's giving any space or time um, to anyone like, mm-hmm. and I was just like and I said to him and I'm like what made you talk to me because have you spoken about like that stuff before he goes no I just fucking had this to know Matt you just got this thing about you I just told you everything mm-hmm. and it didn't seem like much to him at the time and it does but I hold on to that conversation yeah like not in depth to what he said but what he was telling me were things that he's probably never told anyone in his life mm-hmm. and I was like fuck like this is why I'm supposed to be here like mm-hmm. supposed to be helping supposed to be doing it and I like got back into security a bit um, and Obviously, I'd tape it off, like, getting on the drugs so much. Like, I still got on the bag every now and again. Drinking was probably more of a, like, a social event for me because I really was focused on, you know, being fit and healthy. But mm. then, obviously, like, moved. I was in Moranbar and single, and then I moved to Sydney, like, to get away from the mines, met a girl. Um, and then, you know, the, the group I found myself in there was a party group again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there was this whole new environment of people that didn't know me mm. that I knew how hard I could party, but it's like the new kid where, again, all this fucking validation of, like, the new guys here, let's let's take him out, let's show him that, like, let's show him how to party. Yeah. And, like, I wasn't egotistical in the sense where I was like, fuck, I can party harder than you. Mm. I was just like, right, I will fucking, let's dance. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, so then, one two day benders came into play and mm. it was just like there was a game there was this fucking cycle <laughs> where like again shit was cheap um, really really easily accessible um, you know I found myself like now not doing anything cheap everything I was drinking was high end everything mm. I was taking was cocaine I, and the, the assumption was high end mm. and I just found myself like again and I blew out from like 112 kilos to 132 kilos in like 7 months mm. Wow, and that's on my Instagram. Like yeah. I, I had I had competed. So there was actually a block that I've obviously skipped here, where you see back in 2017 where I competed naturally, and I speak about it where I was, you know, in 2022. My mindset about why the fuck am I happy all the time? Mm. So to be like four percent on stage and be 132 kilos with the same mindset and mm. don't know how to set myself free because competing when I was natural was the only thing I think that saved my life because mm-hmm. I did seven comps pretty consecutively. Yeah. Um, I could guess you could say the bodybuilder in town. Mm. I trained religiously yeah. and then I found that groove again, which saved my life because mm. I'd always trained religiously before I, all through the mines and stuff like that, but he moved to Sydney and blew out to like 132 kilos mm. and I didn't even see it. Yeah. And then I was like, I was looking back at photos now and I'm just like, holy fucking shit. Like, <laughs> how? Like, yeah. You know, just 
snack packs, bags, and fucking. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in Sydney, so you know you're gonna get a good snack pack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Like, I mean, I look at, I guess, the old pictures of me and when I blew up, and I, mm. yeah, it's just like, how do, how did I get, how did I get it to that place? And I mean, it's very easy to just, yeah, if you just. If, I mean, if you're not exercising properly and you're not, I mean, for the most part, probably if you're not eating properly, mm. then, yeah, you can easily blow out. And then if you, I mean, for me, the amount of booze that I was drinking, all mm. those empty calories added on top. When you say, like, because you drunk, I've listened to a couple. For you, on a high-end weekend, what were you drinking? Well, I mean, I, I mean, the joke I used to say was, like, a 12-drink minimum, and then it would be, like, I'd have, like, either, like, half a carton of beer, and then if it was, like, a bottle of rum usually and then like and then if i made it out it would be whatever i had out as well mm. and a lot of the time yeah i couldn't i couldn't tell you what i had when i was out because yeah you just be in a blackout so yeah those black holes eh? yeah like, i knew how hard i worked and i just think back to the amount of either drinks i shouted like just getting that card out it seemed to be the only thing i could remember doing mm. throughout my days of getting fucked up with yeah. was getting hundreds of dollars out of the atm whether it was like shouting people at the bar drinks but mm. it was like and that seemed to be the only thing I could remember yeah and a pocket full of receipts mm. and I like remember just time after time like rich like f- before washing f- just reaching and not even wanting to look mm. like just yeah because, and, but the guilt of knowing that there was like 10 or 15 or even 20 receipts in there I'm like mm. each one of them has got to be 60 bucks yeah right? yeah I was like <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to look yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is like yeah, it's like not looking at your bank statement the next morning and seeing yeah, all the ATM withdrawals oh, all man. the <laughs> just, it like a little bit of my heart just broke then like, <laughs> but, like, but then you know you, you get to the point where you really try and navigate because whether you're 18 or it was for me it was um 2021 like the early stages of of that year that i really was like what the fuck am i doing Mm. like what is the consequence like do i want to be successful because i've got every fucking trade like at three trades before i was 40 and then i've got all this accessibility to knowledge Mm. i know i'm smart as fuck Mm. and then it clicked to me when i said that i know i'm smart as fuck this thing off my head went no you're fucking not mm. and I was like, like even now it hits me like a motherfucker because I'm like where did that come from yeah and I like remember it was almost like clockwork I was like I was sitting with it and then one of the boys rang like bro you want to come for a drink I was like yep mm. so for me there was this instantaneous but then I couldn't stop thinking about it yeah um, and it was coming up and I'd about probably about a year prior I'd read the book um, A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle Mm -hmm. so I had this uh, understanding of pain bodies and you know moderate level of coping mechanisms and ego and I was like I started to see more of it Mm -hmm. and you know as you start to see whatever you see more of literally you see more of and Mm -hmm. it just starts to flood into your world and then I drank with him that night we got pretty fucked up but then the next day um, I was due to go out to Rockhampton um, with my brothers and we went to work up there in Rockhampton with them and they actually flew home the following Friday and I went out by myself um, drank like a bowl of red wine I was told that by this local you never get coke in in Rockhampton you're not a local no one can get it if you don't know anyone Mm. for me fucking challenge accepted (laughs) (laughs) let's go so I was just I went and sat literally did what I always used to do when mm. I fucking didn't know anyone or I'd be out working or working away went and sat at the most popular pub saw the most popular motherfucker that everyone liked mm. went and bought him a drink got chatting and I'm like bro did you get a bag he said yeah bro how many you need mm. and I was like ching 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 two, <laughs> two straight ups huh? like <laughs> walked straight into the bathroom half out whopped it brought yeah. him in with me whopped the other bag and he was like fuck you're a go on <laughs> I'm sitting with him and then I was like, fuck, no, I've got to go. Like, I've got to drive to see some friends five hours away. Mm. So I, like, went back, um, packed the room up, felt pretty good because obviously who the fuck wouldn't. Mm. Um, and I, like, was like, I'll just have a nap. And I was like, you fucking idiot, you're not going to nap. Mm. Got behind the, the wheel, but I was actually really fucking tired. Mm. And I drove, and I forget how fast I was going, but... And I can show, I'll show you the photo so maybe you can put it up for the watchers and listeners. But mm. I remember falling asleep. Like, well, I don't remember falling asleep. I remember 
my chest hitting the steering wheel of my bro- brother's car, the car being 45 degrees in there, and I came to, and everything was around me, and the car was like slow motion, and it hit the ground so hard, bent the two front wheels in, um, and it was like pitch black. Mm. It was like literally halfway between Rockhampton and Emerald. So there yeah. was no one. Mm. Like, no one. Like, all I could hear was the sound of the engine cooling down and the coolant dripping out of the thing. And I was like wired. Um, I pushed the car off the road, mm. like onto this fucking like grassy area. Um, and I couldn't find anyone. I couldn't see anything. I like rang some people, scared the fuck out of my entire family because I thought that that was the best thing to do was call your family at three o'clock in the morning tell them you've had an accident and they can't get to you yeah, that's yeah. the best thing to do <laughs> um, and then like it was I fell asleep in the driver's seat and I woke up and I was like fuck fuck, fuck for that and I woke up in the same clothes I was in the night before and the car was like wrecked and I was like fuck and I got out and there were two perfect tyre tracks between like literally on the right hand side when I look back there was like four poles Mm. on the left hand side there were two poles Mm. and the tire tracks could not be any more clearer on both sides of all those poles straight through it Mm. and i'd hit a ditch so for me in that moment i was like i'm pretty lucky Mm. still probably pretty fucked managed like i got out of there everything's okay everything's good my back home hurt a bit i got home and my brother who was not a very like emotionally like he doesn't cuddle he's when we were drinking he'll tell you everything in the way he loves about you which is I I know that he feels that way sober Mm. but I walked into the house in the morning and he fucking hugged me he goes fucking glad you're alright man and I was like what have I done Mm. like what have I done like Mm. excuse me and I just was like is this the point where I get to in my life where I fucking die and every single person in my family wishes that I hadn't Mm. because I come from a massive family like I know right now that I could call any one of them and if they could take the call and not working, I could tell them they love me and they could tell me they love me back. And there's like 30 of them. Mm-hmm. And there was this massive like, I could just see myself in the casket and I could just see all 30 of them like saying like, why? Mm. And I fucking just, I was like, I'm gonna do something. Yeah. I have to do something like, like fucking soon because this, this path I'm traveling on is gonna fucking, it's, mm-hmm. if I die, I don't have to worry about me anymore. But every single anniversary, every single birthday, every single thing, like, because I love my family and I yeah. bring them fucking religiously. So mm. for me, I literally created this environment where I can bring my whole family together. Like my 40th birthday was my entire family. Mm. And that's all I wanted. Yeah. It had been one fucking meter to the right or left of that, on that fucking path. There would have been 30 fucking people and whoever else that was there, like, I mean, dude, what a wasted life. Mm. Yeah. Like, are you are you that invaluable to yourself that you would take yourself and the man that you are away from all of these nieces and nephews and cousins and people that look up to you? Because mm. I know in myself, and I fucking get goosebumps saying it on my legs, like, and I was done. Mm. Went 50 days, um, drug and alcohol free, and my whole life changed. Like, yeah. I saw, like, I was walking better. Like, my heart felt full. Mm. Like I had this like, I had this wow factor in the mornings where my my alarm goes off at 3.30 and I was like, holy fucking shit, how am I supposed to feel like this (laughs) at 3.30 in the morning, you know? And I was like up and then, you know, like, and I've said this before, a beautiful human um, named Watin there, one day I fell off the bandwagon and I got back on it with my brothers um, and I went to see them the next day and I was like, bro, like, bro, how, how, how are you so fucking happy all the time, bro? Like, mm. how? And he goes, bro, have you ever given your spirit the chance, like, set yourself free and see where your spirit can take you? Mm-hmm. And I was like, and I just sat with it. It just fucking muted me. And that's when I spoke to you earlier. Like, I, like the, un- the universe and however many gods there are in that moment chose to give me a fork in the road. And one of those roads was a fucking 50-foot wall that I couldn't get around, go through, or climb under. And the only way I knew from them was to choose my spirit over spirits and Mm. drugs and stuff. So there was just this massive change of like, man, like it just felt like the shedding of the proverbial onion where each and every week I was like, Jim's getting better. My life's getting better. The people coming into my life 
now uh, understand and I have the strength to say I'm fucking done with drugs and alcohol mm. man like if you are going to make me feel bad and I the one time I remember and this was a really long time friend of mine I went around there and I said like I'm not drinking man like I just I mean, I'd say hello I hadn't seen him in a long time and he just pushed and pushed and pushed me and I said motherfucker like I want to say <laughs> I said country <laughs> <laughs> um, brother like I'm not the person that you have me as now. Mm. That person that you remember me of, is I'm not that person. So yeah. until you break free from that person and join me where I am, and that's not, I'm not here and you're here. We're here. Mm. I'm just here. Mm. And this is where I'm at. If you're not going to meet me there, mate, I can't fucking come around here anymore yeah. because your life is your life. And I don't fucking belittle or berate anyone that wants to do the things they do because mm. at the end of the day, we do what we do anyway. Mm. And he, to this day, hasn't rung me back or called yeah. me. And I know he could be sitting in guilt or just sitting in whatever he needs, but I, he since unfollowed me on Instagram and I know because like he was one of the first people I had. Mm. So it was quite easy and I didn't lose too much sleep over it, I yeah. forgive him, but to step into like the work. Yeah. You know, the cultish behavior is so called by some people. <laughs> like, you know, the, journey, the journey into self to do the first retreat and, and just... You know, that builder, like, nothing about the work is fucking enjoyable. Mm. I can tell you right now. Yeah. If you think that when you pick up your first conscious reality, wherever you find it, because it'll be a book, a human, a life, a dog, a beach, a moment, that first hit of conscious that breaks you free from the the matrix that you live in, in your own matrix, is going to suck. Mm. And it's going to suck every single time after that. Yeah. But the beautiful thing is, is that that moment where you broke free from the next time that comes around and you navigate through it with ease, mm. that's the fun part. Yeah. And that's the part where you're like, I'm not drinking now. Mm. And if you, you know, there's nothing, I know this is called the Last Drinks Podcast, but mm. I've got nothing against people that want to have a few margies on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. But for me, I know now that Last Drinks is fucking Last Drinks. Yeah. And, you know, I think when I watched the podcast with Tynan that you did, you know, like the way that he articulates his words and things like that it showed it quite a lot where you can see that no powerful motherfucker in a man will ever push away another man wanting to be better mm. and that's what makes men what we are yeah. but when you look at like drugs and alcohol there's this anxious attachment where people that wouldn't usually be friends hang out because there's that association of drugs and alcohol yeah. well, I'm not saying that the people that hang out are, one guy's a bad guy one guy's a good guy mm. you just see these odd friendships yeah, yeah. and like once you stop drinking and once you stop partying that friendship dissipates mm. and they both go their different ways and find their people Yeah. and I think there's just this like transition where it's just you know like we're so groomed to hang out and have a couple of beers mm. you know how many times have you seen a couple of guys at a party and they don't want to they don't want to stop drinking <laughs> no i mean i would have wanted to be one of those guys <laughs> at one point so me too yeah yeah Absolutely. <laughs> and the first thing i would have said to you is can you bang yeah <laughs> can you pay? Have, you got, have you got drugs there all right let's yeah, go yeah yeah, um, yeah one minute starts in the mocky yeah and i mean i think for most people when they again i guess for me yeah like going on a sober journey yeah, like the people around you do change. Mm. I, you know, I mean, you're giving up something that potentially was a big part of your life. So, yeah, you, the way you look, the world, the way you interact, the way you things that you enjoy doing, you know, will change. And you know, that can't. I mean, change can be of uncomfortable and daunting. But at the end of the day, it's just like, well, you're curious about change because there's some part of you that what you're doing right now isn't really satisfying mm. I guess your needs and, and isn't serving you best so that's why you, you're looking out to say well, what else is out there but I'll then I have to quit drinking then I lose my friends it's just mm. like well you want you'll only lose the friends that weren't real friends in the first place are you losing friends though mm. like to step into that like I didn't really disconnect from friends to push them away but once I stopped being so interactive with getting on it the natural progression is i've heard other people say it with, around people that have stopped and it's like oh look just don't don't invite that person because they don't really do that much, do that anymore mm. to me i didn't i know that would have got said about me because of the circles of friends i had and yeah. i know that that's not disrespectful to them mm. it's just that they were probably making decisions for me not mm. realizing that that was unnecessary because now yeah. I can go to events like my 40th I said like 
I wanted it to be during the day. I want that there can be an open bar. But for me, the idea of during the day was people are less likely to, to get themselves really fucked up mm. than they are if they're going to go to a night party. Yeah, yeah. But like back what you said, like when you start to change, you got to get real fucking comfortable with being uncomfortable mm. and sit in that uncomfort because yeah. that uncomfortable and the way that you try to reach out to coping mechanisms, your phone, drugs, alcohol, toxic relationships, and your ex-girlfriend when you haven't rubbed one out for a week or two. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you start to say dumb shit. You, yeah. know? Like, <laughs> you get sick of pornography. Like. <laughs> well, well, I mean, we want to go down that path. I mean... Like porn in, in itself is like such a, um, it's a good servant, but a poor master. Mm. And when you, like myself, you know, I stopped watching porn um, probably probably around about the same time. I've slipped up a few times, like properly, because I used to watch it probably like f- maybe five or six times a week for probably 20 years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, back when it was dial-up internet. Yeah. Like, you know, that's... <laughs> <laughs> took 30 seconds took yeah. fucking three minutes for and a little I, image to all, come up yeah all i had to see was just something mm. and for me it was that click that i was like able to rub one out and i'd feel good and then it would be off and i'd be able to fucking do whatever i wanted yeah but, um you know and again i go back to what a fucking is it tyrant tynan tyron tyron sorry mate um tyron said like i actually used to belittle myself in the last probably five months it's probably been about five months, actually. Um, like where I didn't want to rub one out because I was I had belittled myself so much around mm. watching porn that I was like not going to do it because every time I even when I wasn't using porn, I was just in my own thoughts. I would feel guilty afterwards. Yeah. And when the big fella said like, you know, you can still do it, but you know, spend a bit more time, you know, centering yourself mm. and you know when you start to center yourself and i've actually since doing that and and you know like that playing out for me it's actually changed my whole perception on the actual like you know journey the journey into self i suppose you could mm. say without getting too deep with crass crass words but you know porn um when i did a, a retreat um in mid-december last year and i was talking to quite a few of the boys there about it and one of the boys that was on that retreat heard me speaking and he stopped watching he went hit on friday when we got there he i told him about the story he told his partner i'm going to stop watching porn and he reckons that on the sunday morning before he came back to the retreat was some of the best sex that he'd had in mm-hmm. a long time and, yeah. he, and he came up to me he thanked me and um i was like mate like what did i do mm. he goes just the way that you you spoke you know mm. like I've said this to quite a few men that have reached out to me that know my history around porn and they're like, oh, my, I just don't love my girlfriend anymore, my, my partner anymore. Um, you know, like, I don't know what to do. I'm like, are you still watching porn? And like, yeah, I'm like, well, then you're the fucking problem. Mm. And honestly, the phone, like, you would think that he'd, that he'd hung up, put, put me on mute or whatever. I'm like, dude, I'm not a relationship expert in any way, but mm. I can tell you right now that if you are not having sex with your partner watching porn for validation and not communicating that you are watching porn to your partner you're the fucking problem in the relationship yeah because if she is crying herself to sleep because you've already wasted all this energy on 30 seconds of Mm -hmm. some girl that doesn't give a fuck about you getting thrashed by some dude doesn't give a fuck about her Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) respectively yeah yeah yeah. then you you yourself are the issue because Mm. you've taken something away from the queen that she is and given that energy to an environment that they're paid to do. Mm. So if you just stop touching your dick, brought all that attention to her and just allowed yourself to be seen, then I guarantee like it'll change your whole perception. Mm. And funnily enough, <laughs> one of the guys that I ra- like I actually railroaded into like the idea of that he's the problem. I was like, have you ever just looked, you know, when was the last time you looked, let's just say Candace, for example, is the thing, in the eyes, just for two minutes, just an eye gaze. Mm. He goes, oh, I can't remember the last time. I was like, well, when was the last time you actually like heart to heart hugged her? Mm. And again, I'm not a relationship expert. This is all things that I've learned. And like, he's like, I don't know. So we'll do tonight when you get a minute to sit and to lock, look her in the eyes and then give her a 90 second hug afterwards. <laughs> Next day, 
phone, uh, two, missed, two missed calls and a text message. He goes, mm. bro, ring me. <laughs> 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 hey, mate, how are you? He goes, holy fucking shit, man. What's going on with that eye gaze thing? I'm like, it's just the connection, man. Like, mm. you're seeing her soul, bros. Yeah. You, you download these apps that you can fucking shut off the porn really quickly but you've closed your mind off to the idea of opening your mind to your beautiful girl. Like, mm. and again, I'm going to reiterate this. I'm not a relationship expert. I suck. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm working on it. Okay, I've got mummy issues. <laughs> <laughs> She's okay with it now. It's me letting go of what I believe she should have been and I've all the things. But mm. So anyway, but you know, as we say, we're always good at giving advice. Yeah. But just the things that I, like, I know now that I'm going to implement is I try and pass on and it's not like you should do this. I'm like, when was the last time? You know, and then when he did that, it was just like, so to break free from porn mm. is, it's a massive understanding. And it took me, like, even now, I think back, like, I had, like, because, you know, shadow children, like, I had my, started watching, like, Penthouse Black Label at 13. Mm. So I would be 20, I'd be, what, 37 years old, and having this shadow child from 13 years old telling it's okay to have a sneaky wank. Mm. When my missus is like 10 minutes away, about to come home from work. Yeah. And yet I'm telling her that I'm not on the mood. Babe, it's me. No, it's not me. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's me. Well, it fucking is me mm. because I'm the one that just rubbed one out over again for a situation that really didn't... You know, if I just waited 10 minutes, mm. I probably would have got everything I wanted and then some from her. Yeah. And I've actually reached out to her and apologized to her mm-hmm. um, since then because like I've said, look, you need to know that when I said it was me, it was, and this is what I was doing. Yeah. And she fucking like thanked me. She was like, I, for years, well, not for, yeah, no, she was like, for years, there were times, obviously we had great sex, but like for years, you know, there would be times when she thought I'd be on mm. and I'd be off. Yeah. And literally, how do you tell the, at the time, the love of your life that you don't want to have sex with her because you just watched fucking some random shit that you just seem mm. to like that that triggered that little part of your brain mm. to enjoy that film three second gif of whatever yeah. like you know so like i've spoken to i guess women and they talked about being with partners yeah like the guy watching porn ruined the relationship because yeah like they it made them feel like oh i'm not desirable enough that they would rather just go consume pornography mm. than to be with them and I was like, oh, that's interesting. It was, it was an interesting perspective to learn that because, I mean, I, like I sort of said on that episode with Tyron that if I, because if I was to be in a relationship, yeah, look, I wouldn't want to be consuming it. And mm. it is, it's, it, like I relate to a lot what you say. There is just something that just, something, that, something that's in there is just like, oh, this disturbance. Mm. And I can relieve it with, with just, all right, just a quick watch mm. of porn and then yeah. off we go and on, on when you go. And as like I said when I first when started chatting, like it's not that I... I know in myself, raised by my grandfather, that I have the utmost respect for women. So when there was no sexualization of women in general, it was like just that quick hit mm. that I required, you know, and it was like so quick. Yeah. You know, like I could be in and out of home in like two minutes, mm. you know, and it's ridiculous to think that yeah. you would consume like two minutes of that particular energy would now be gone forever and I would to come home and my you know, girlfriend be there and she's not going to get any of that because mm. I'm literally three days of the week just wasting that fucking beautiful energy mm. and fucking pointless bullshit. So did you, I guess to go back to, cause you've mentioned that you've done what sounds like a lot of inner work on yourself. Mm. I guess once the, the smoke and the fog clears from the drugs and the booze, then you've gone to look inward. So what sort of thing, cause you've mentioned going on retreats. So mm. what sort of things and tools did you learn from those experiences? I would I use the metaphor it's like you walk into Bunnings and everything that you want is at your fingertips Mm. and that's like on the Gold Coast with all these particular retreats and these beautiful humans doing all the work it's just like Bunnings they've got all the tools for you but until you really step into the work and just piece by piece like no one said you had to walk into like if you wanted to a five day fucking retreat where they tear you to pieces and put you back together again for me it was like had that accident um and i my the first retreat was like again it was pretty it was a great retreat to go on for the first time um but i had had a mate down and we went out the night before and had had drinks and bag Mm. so i went into that first retreat not at my best Mm. and 
it was actually the the perfect um, thing for me to do because from then on I learned that the amount of respect that you have to have for yourself to even step through those gates of any type of work you need to be clear-minded or in the process of shutting shit out that creates that fog that you speak of because the journey into self you know you if with drugs and alcohol you're just putting smoke in the way and the torch can't see past it Mm. and the ego will throw shit up and you won't be able to navigate it properly because there's just this whole dynamic of what the work allows you like you could i could go on the same one day retreat and each time i went i would get something different Mm. because as much the same as reading a book yeah and each retreat i've been on with with like similar people they articulate themselves differently and they level up and that's the beautiful thing about the journey is that you know like i say it's like i said at the start like i guarantee you that you can go on a retreat or a one day workshop or something and the people that you meet will add you on Instagram mm. and they won't be hung over and have anxiety to reach out to tell you what a good person you are because nine times out of ten on one of those retreats or those events that you go to they're going to tell you that it's okay to speak to another man and tell that man you love them for what they are right then and there mm. and that's one thing that came up massive for me because the big thing for me was what I thought my dad should be mm-hmm. and I held him to that like for years and I even was only like two, a year and a half ago I apologised to him I was like dad like I I'm sorry because I held you in a position that I thought you should be but you've done a fucking amazing job mm. like I'm you know <laughs> irrespective of the shit that was probably going on but yeah. I said like you know so credit to you and to my mum as well so since then like once you start to let go of the stories that and this has probably been said by many a person before like the stories of what you tell yourself about what something should have been and then you're frustrated with that particular story that was never a fucking reality. Mm. So once you drop that reality away, like for me now, I went and down and hung out with my dad. One-on-one, we went for a surf together. That's the first time I've hung out with my dad by himself with him and I ever. Mm. Like I don't, since the last time he gave me a fucking hiding, which was when I was like, 14 and I told him not to do that again <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know um, so to step into that yeah is it too late no but the the thing about drugs and alcohol is that we go back to that responsibility yep you've got a responsibility with drugs and alcohol but you've also got a responsibility to yourself mm. and that responsibility to yourself is to not let yourself beat yourself up over shit that you can control mm. because at the end of the day like I said you can go into any workshop and shut off and take no tools mm. like you can get you can go into fucking Bunnings get tools use them and go back and get a refund if you're that tight mm. but when it comes to the work on the journey when you start each individual thing and I explained this before nothing about the, the work is enjoyable but that event that comes around that beforehand hits you you can never get it through it easier it's actually called the wave effect so the first time something comes at you you don't know how to deal with it it's massive it's Mm. a huge fucking wave you have no idea how to get out of it no idea how to get around it it fucking smashes you Mm. and it literally tumbles you and tumbles you it rattles you drugs alcohol all the things come into your world the next time the same situation comes around again Mm -hmm. it's a little bit smaller it still rattles you but you know not to probably get so much of a particular coping mechanism you reach out to someone that you've been at a retreat with or you bring someone in that you've seen tell a story that you can um you know like what's the word i'm looking for like you know you've got something in common with them Mm. then the next wave comes and it's not so big yeah there's this you can understand it now and you're like oh you motherfucker (laughs) like and that's that's the that's the enjoying enjoyment of it is that that wave now gets smaller Mm. and then the one after it is even smaller again and you're like oh and that's what makes the journey work fun Mm. because once you get to the point where now it's just a flat surface that same literally wave that fucking crushed you be it two years ago six months ago three months ago comes up and it's like how is that even a problem Mm. and that's what you get from the work yeah whether it's with you know like the boys at the brotherhood or mm. amend or, or like you know michael cooper like I, I haven't been down to see the boys at the brotherhood but i it is on the on the list but because mm. i see them doing great work on their instagram but they're like i said to you all of these great men and women 
Happy International Women's Day too. <laughs> All these great women, like Nadine Miller from uh, in coaching, like fuck, she's amazing. Like, no one is going to push you away. Mm. You've spent tens, possibly hundreds of thousands of dollars on drugs and alcohol. Yeah. But you won't spend ninety nine or two grand on a retreat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, you're fucking joking. <laughs> you know, like you won't. I guarantee you right now, and I don't speak for him and thing, but you could probably go see, like the boys at Brotherhood. Tell them you've got no money for a week, but then tell them that you do have money, but you really got shit going on, mm. and they'll fucking bring you in. Yeah. And I would do it. Like, I know most of the bros and boys that I know, you know, if you say oh, you want to be better, fuck, man, sit here, bros, mm. talk to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've sat at pubs where boys have been having beers, and one guy's had one beer, and he figures out, I don't drink. Mm. And then he's like, why don't you drink, bro? I'm like, I tell you why, bros. Mm. This is why. And he's like, I've watched men push away beers and be like, fuck. Yeah. Well, if you can do it, I can do it. And I said, mm. no, you could always do it. Yeah. You just needed to see that there was someone else that had the balls to say, fuck you, you, and you. And now I go home with a full pocket, no beers and no bags. Mm. I'm up at 3.30. I'm smashing my gym session, sauna, day started, beach walk, I'm fucking done. Yeah, yeah. And the same guys, you look at their Instagram and it's like they've posted a video four hours ago and then it was just like, <laughs> fuck that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't miss those. Yeah, you just fucking, mm. yeah, people, I see, I'd rather seize the morning than, yeah, seize the night. Well, yeah, like this, I said, yeah. you know, that, I think, you know, anything in the con- like the conscious community, like, you know, what Geordie's doing with S30 at Mermaid Beach there with the ice baths and, you know, like um, the Stratton boys at Change and Broad Beach, you know, like everyone's got this um, initiative to be better. Mm. And can you be better while getting on it? Yeah, you definitely can. But, you know, like why would you, why would you go through life, you know, when, with the handbrake on? Mm. And you've, you, we've all driven a car with a handbrake on a little bit fucking things start screaming at you you're going slower it stinks like mm. it's the same shit with drugs and alcohol yeah and yeah look I might you know some people might be like yeah but you were the loosest motherfucker I, I knew <laughs> and I'm like yeah key word knew mm. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah knew because right now like I'm getting getting after it mm. you know and I definitely wouldn't you know to have to even talk to you to have the confidence to have this conversation is like something I, I don't think I probably ever would have had mm. to talk this in this depth about it but yeah. Yes. Well, I appreciate you coming on and sharing it because yeah, no, it's been a wh- it's me. been quite a whirlwind, yeah, for sure. Because <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, like if you were to, if I mean, that's how it's. I mean, you mentioned being in pubs with people who are drinking, and you say you don't drink, you tell them why, and then that inspires them to re- reassess their decisions. If someone was to quit, you know, looking to quit, yeah, if it's drinking, if it's drugs, you know, is that sort of all right? Focus on. Getting tapering off that, or then redirecting your focus to, I guess, why you feel the need to do all um, those substances. There's reasonings as to why we go to the lengths we do to drink as much as we do. Like, if you have the power in yourself to love yourself unconditionally, unconditional love of self is not getting yourself that inebriated that you fucking can't remember mm. who you are or what you say or how you do it. You know, like if there's a point where to go into a, a thing a bit more, like if you do want to step away from it, it em, like the term is just embrace the suck because mm. it's going to suck to not to see photos of people that you used to go out with having fun without you. It's going to suck to see things. But what you are going to get is like such a, a gratuitous amount of friends that will want to be friends with you mm. and you're worth it because a lot of people drink you know, like I think, I forget it was you, like if you've got a group of friends that can only be around you when you're drinking, they're not your group of friends. Mm. If you can't go somewhere and not drink Mm. and you start to get real rowdy, I just don't think that that's quite the the circumstances of a great friendship. Yeah. But I mean, again, there's no disrespect to anyone. Those are just the things that have come up for me. And Mm. I've got friends now that I can go and have, you know, soda waters and go out for Mm. dinner and, you know, I, I still, one of my friends came over before he went to a retreat and I smelled a beautiful bottle of whiskey, mm. but not one ounce of me wanted to have a drink. Yeah. And it was a beautiful bottle because I've smelled plenty <laughs> of whiskey. <laughs> you know, like I've been to Melbourne to the, the whiskey hut and I've, you know, but for me, I was like, oh, that's really nice. Thank you. Mm. And he goes, are you sure? I'm like, there's no sure. It's no. Yeah, it's no. Yeah. It's always no. Yeah. But to step away from it, like, just like set a uh, what I first did actually this is probably just came up for me the first thing I started doing was I did drink 
but I would set three alarms. My first alarm would be 7.30 because that's generally about the time when sun's gone down and everyone's getting a bit thirsty and an alarm would go off and I would have three big glasses of water and then my 7.45 alarm would go off and I would start saying my goodbyes and it got to the point by 8 o'clock I was done. Mm-hmm. And then you can't drink as much. Yeah. And you sit in this, you start to drop it into your subconscious because a lot of people, when you start to drink, you lose the ability of your subconscious. Mm. If you've drunk enough or drunk so much that by 7.30 when that alarm goes off, you switch it off, you should be going then. Mm. You know, like, so I started to do that. And then I'd be at like some friends or like, around my brothers when they were drinking and the seven, the alarm would go off and they'd be like, oh, that's Christopher's alarm. He's going to leave soon. <laughs> you know, and, but like there was this thing where it was because you can't tell me what to do anymore. Because, mm. you know, just have my life. Just have my life. Yeah, yeah, man. Like, you know, you love him. You love yeah. him. You, you, like, you love him, Argy. Yeah. Like, you, know, you know, like, you know, they bring out other drinks or, you know, they try and coach you to stay. Like, oh man, please stay. Like, you know, you're so much fun. It's like, I know. But, you know, my day tomorrow starts at this time and it just became a point then where like I said to really on the 16th was like I remember I moved all my alarms an hour down mm-hmm. so then my alarm went off at 6.30 I think it was 6.30 and I was 6 and then at 6.30 the sunset was just coming to an end by 7 I was gone and I was home mm. and I was like fuck like and I, that was the kicker for me. I was like, fuck, I'm just done. Mm. So, you know, like no one said that you had to, because no one said you had to deliberately be like, I'm giving up drinking. Fuck you all. It's, mm. that's, that's broadcasting. You know, you don't yeah. need to do that. If you're going to do it, just taper off yourself. Mm. Just set the alarms and, and do things for yourself. Because like, at the end of the day, like much the same as if you lost your job, someone will fill your spot. Yeah. Like they, the group of chairs that you're sitting in when you leave just closes, mm. and then see how quickly are you gone? Check their fucking Instagrams ten minutes later. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's just prioritizing yourself. And yeah. if this is what you truly want, mm. you should be able to do that. And I mean, I allude back to even when before when you were being pushed to have a drink, mm. and you were very firm on your boundaries. I mean, that was something I didn't learn until I went to rehab was boundaries. I never heard of mm. the concept of that. And how you're firm, like, no, I'm not, this is who I am now. Mm. And this is who I'm going to be going forward. And if you can't meet me at that, then I can't, you know, we can't, I guess this friend, I guess this friendship cannot go yeah, forward. Absolutely. Like boundaries, as you just said, then like boundaries are like a muscle. Mm. You have to build it up. Yeah. You know, like, you know, resistance to, we all know that, Tim Tams and KFC and Maccas and you know whatever food you prefer is amazing mm. but the point is is you've got a boundary in yourself that you know that there's a point you don't have so much of it mm. like you just said to them what, and what day in rehab for you was it you were like the penny dropped about boundaries yeah. was it a big one <laughs> <laughs> it was like I, why didn't I learn this in fucking high school like why am I learning it I had to go fuck myself up be put in an institution <laughs> to learn st- like values as well like values and boundaries it's like why isn't this shit what the f- what the f- i was learning about fucking shit learning about fucking shakespeare and pythagoras theorem in school never never fucking read a shakespeare book since yeah, well, how's yeah. that going your taxes <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i didn't learn how to do my taxes either so i mean that's a whole nother fucking podcast well, talking yeah. about the education system but yeah um, no fuck let's not yeah no <laughs> Like lunchtime and playtime, and like yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, the f- my favorite times of school was recess, lunch, and leaving. So, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I think if I went at all, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, Chris. Mate, it's been quite a honestly with an awesome chat. Some of the like, I feel very grateful to be here. With yeah, some of the, the talent you've had on here, so mm. it's been amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Well, we'll just end on what's the best piece of advice that you've received? Uh, what you do when no one's watching makes you who you are what you do like the small things that you do you know like if you are stopping something if you do it when no one's watching that's who you are so are you that person and do you need to be that person you know like it's a massive one to 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 tell the world that you're you can listen to our podcast and you're going to do something but it's what you do behind the scenes when you're by yourself that truly will show up and make you who you are. Mm. Mm. Wow. 
That's awesome. <laughs> Cheers to that, Chris. Mate, That's some good advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been the Last Strings Podcast. I'm Will Hitchens. We'll see you in the next one.